His name was Hans Seiler, a husband, a father, a teacher, and an experienced mountaineer. But he was also a liar. Imagine a snowstorm so fierce it turns a simple mountain hike into a life or death struggle. In April 1954, a group of students and teachers set out on what was supposed to be an adventure, but it quickly turned into one of the most tragic events in Alpine history. This is the story of the Heilbronn-Dachstein tragedy. In the spring of 1954, the Dachstein Massif in Upper Austria became the silent witness to a tragedy that would claim the lives of 13 individuals. Ten students and four teachers from Heilbronn, Germany, embarked on an ill-fated ascent, unaware of the deadly snowstorm that awaited them. It was during Holy Week when around 150 people, including a group from the Heilbronn Boys Middle School, arrived at the Obertron Federal Sports School for their holiday. Among them, a smaller group of 14, led by teacher Hans-Georg Seiler, planned an ascent to the Krippenstein on Maundy Thursday, April 15th. At 6 a.m., the group left the hostel, eager to start their hike, despite unfavorable weather conditions, their spirits high. The weather report, though, showed ideal conditions, mild temperatures, northwest winds, a cloudy sky, and occasional light rain. Hans informed the hostel workers of their route and their expected return time of 6 p.m. However, as the snowstorm grew fiercer, they ignored repeated warnings from locals and workers, including the landlady of the Schoenbergalm hut and two workers from the material cable car who were descending from Support 5. They were the last people to see the 13 victims alive. Even Hildegard Matz, one of the teachers, turned back after two hours, a decision that would save her life. The rest continued, into the unknown. By 6 p.m., the boys who hadn't been chosen for the hike and the remaining teachers waited anxiously. But half an hour passed, and there was no sign of the group. The hostel owner began to worry, especially after unexpected snow had started falling. Calls to huts along the planned route brought confusion. Nobody had seen them. The worst snowstorm in years was raging, and the group was nowhere to be found. Panic set in as everyone tried to piece together what had happened. Why didn't the group turn back? Why wasn't there a single sign of them along their route? The answer was simple. They'd never stepped foot on it. Hildegard Matz, who had turned back earlier, realized the route being discussed didn't match the one Hans had mentioned. They knew then the group was in serious trouble. Despite the treacherous conditions, two small but experienced search parties went out that night. One became lost. The other returned with no clues. By morning, the largest Alpine rescue to date began. Retracing the group's steps, witnesses confirmed they had taken a different path, miles away from the original route. The group had been seen at an inn around 9 a.m., miles off course. Hans ignored every warning about the storm, leading the group further into danger. The final sighting of the group was around 11 a.m. Over 400 mountain rescuers, Alpine police officers, and volunteers scoured the area. Days turned into weeks. Rescue efforts continued in vain. Nine days later, on April 24th, rescuers found a makeshift shelter and, eventually, bodies buried in snow and the camera capturing a disturbing truth. The photos told a haunting story, from laughter and adventure to cold, exhaustion, and finally, a whiteout. But it wasn't until May 28th that the last two victims were found, Hans Seiler and the youngest schoolboy, Rolf Richard Mössner. He was just 14. As it later turned out, Hans wasn't the mountaineer he claimed to be. He lied about the route, ignored warnings, and executed his own outlandish plans. The group had lost their way in the snowstorm, and instead of following the route to the Krippenstein, they continued uphill in the opposite direction. Exhausted and lost, all 13 succumbed to the freezing temperatures. Hans's arrogance and disregard for authority ultimately led to tragedy. In the aftermath, memorials were erected to honor the victims. A stone in Heilbronn's main cemetery, a chapel on the Krippenstein, and the Heilbronner Kreutz marked the places where the young lives were lost. But the question remains, why would Hans do this? While his students loved him, some peers saw a darker side. Hans insisted that he knew what he was doing and was overheard saying things like, they're young boys, they just need exercise, and they just have to warm up. It seems his actions that day were driven by a reckless disregard for safety and an overestimation of his abilities. The question of guilt 
was hotly debated. A civil lawsuit was considered, but eventually dropped. Hans paid the ultimate price, but nothing could bring those kids back. Some argue that the tragedy was a result of poor judgment, while others believe it was an unavoidable act of nature. In the end, Hans's legacy is a cautionary tale, a reminder of the fragility of life and the dire consequences of hubris.